Hi everyone, welcome back to OC Avery. Now, through popular request, I've decided to make a full video on the Natives of Norwich Zoom Room we did with Bernard Williams. So obviously we've done that in three parts on breeding hawfinches, breeding clear pied greenies, and the history of the hobby and a bit of the background and things that Bernard's done throughout his time keeping British birds. So today we've got the whole episode. It's about an hour and 50 minutes long. So hopefully you're going to enjoy that. And by doing it all the way through, it's just pick up some more points and whether you're playing that while you're at the gym or you're at work and you're listening to something then then you've got that there so hopefully you enjoy this and i'd just like to say thank you to avian world dublin once again for sponsoring the natives in norwich <laughs> Hello, welcome back to the Natives in Norwich Zoom Room. So today we've finally got the returning episode and we're joined by Mr. Bernard Williams. So thank you for joining us, mate. So would you just like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the bird you keep now and a bit about the bird you've kept in the past? Hi, Oliver. Nice to be here. Um, it was strange talking to bird men over the internet, but it seems to be more and more popular just lately, I think, than that. Uh, than actually going in a show wall and talking. So uh, most definitely be better get used to it, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name's Bernard Williams and um, I've kept birds for 50 odd years, 50 years plus. Um, I run a cage bird society from the age of 19. So how old are you now? I'm 19, yeah. So there you go. So I was running a 2000 bird show at 19. Um, <laughs> 600 borders and um, Gloucesters and 150 Yorkshire canaries, which you just don't see in one show all anymore. And there was 2,000 birds in that event. And, the, and it was at Cobridge TA, where a lot of our British shows, the reason it was there was because I, uh, I was used to that venue from the early days. But uh, so, yeah, so I was running that show um, from the age of 19 for about 20 years. Um, really? taking people on bus trips to the National Exhibition at Alexandra Palace, and two buzzes and trying to run a raffle on one and getting off at the services and jumping on the other bus and going there and um, until you got to Rally Pally and then doing the same on the way back so we could earn a few bob for the club. Uh, jungle sales was the way we made money in them days. And uh, we used to have to stand as birdmen on tables selling, selling clothes for for a penny and took them some, uh, and that's how we could afford to run the show. It was the jumble sales. I don't know if you know of a jumble, have you heard of a jumble sale? Yes, yeah. Yeah, because you don't see them nowadays, do you really? No, no. No, so um, so that that was that, and that's how we earned our money. And um, rail birds were all the thing in them days, and we'd do 300 trips down to Stoke Railway Station to pick birds up in a, in a van, every time the uh, station master rang, we'd have to zoom off in a car down, somebody would, and fetch the rail birds. And every five minutes I was running in the hall saying, who can nip down the station, fetch me some more birds. And, and uh, that's how all the birds arrived in them days. That was right. banned at about 20 years ago. So um, they stopped allowing us to send birds by transport but the birds used to come up on train and go through um go through into the station master's office and the, as soon as they arrived at his office he would then ring to say some more birds for you but we didn't have a mobile phone in them days so it made things a lot more difficult because uh oh yeah nobody had invented mobile phones so, sounds a long time ago but it wasn't actually it was probably 35 years ago or so, so. Wow, yes. well, yeah. from that, um, from that, I um, I uh, started a company called Ceramic Trophies. Ceramic Trophies was a company. Um, I was just looking if I got a picture of Ceramic Trophies. It was, um, it was. Um, there's there's a picture if you can actually. Uh, if you can actually see it. Yeah, I think you just, yeah, sharing screen now. Awesome. Yeah, got, got it. Wow. So there's the stall that I used to run. And um, I was selling trof trophies in China, like you see at um, Staffordshire Bird Show now. 
that was my company for 20 years. And we supplied um, trophies to over 500 cage bird societies. Wow. Um, we haven't got 500 cage bird societies anymore. So, no. Um, and these little ceramic rosettes across the top there, they were quite popular and um, they were different to the norm. So something different to us. And that's just something that I invented and we used and sold to lots that's, and lots of they're, they're amazing. Wow. Yeah, it was um, <laughs> it was um, something that I built up from scratch, and uh, over twenty years, we, were, as I say, we were supplying over five hundred clubs and societies. Um, Fantastic. We'll come off that one now, and back back with you. Yeah. So um, that ran for twenty odd years, and, um, and during that time, nineteen eighty one, we had the inception of the. Um, Countryside and Wildlife Act, when birds had to be rung. Up to that yeah. time, we could show birds without rings on. Um, needless to say, when you went to a show, you'd have, for example, in them days, I won, um, I won a class at the National Exhibition in eight, 1980. Um, there was um, 28 bullfinch cocks, and I imagine they'd been, uh, they'd been caught all over the country, so they were Probably the best bullfinch cocks that you could possibly get your hands on. In them wow. days, it wasn't quite frowned on. And it wasn't legal, but it wasn't really illegal in, them, in the early days. So them birds wow. would have been absolutely phenomenal. And uh, you would get all the top breeders and the people I looked up to, your Terry McCrackens and your Jack Lloyds and your Derry Colnose and... In fact, if I'd have thought to get the catalogue out, I could have read the names of that class because it would have been, it was very scary to see the names. And this particular day in 81, I, in, in 1980, I went down. The National had burnt down at, um, at uh, the Hall had burnt down and they'd moved to Birmingham, Bingley Hall. And, and that burnt down after two years. So we, I think we've wow. got a bit of a history with the National of, um, and I was just showing in them days and uh, taking me bus trips along from, from Hanley Cage Bird Society. But anyway, um, um, I won that class. So I was quite absolutely over the moon, you know, because to be people like Derek Oldno and, you know, your Jack Lloyds and Terry's and Bob Partridge's was just not known for me at that time, in the, you know, in the yeah. late 70s. So um, that was, um, anyway, um, the British Bird Breeders Association, which was a big society in them days, doesn't exist now. We also had the Middle and British Softbill Society. And the British Bird Breeders Association produced uh, a list of all first breedings. They supplied trophies for people. They wasn't, they, they, they wasn't really into the shows the same way. They were more into... Uh, the breeding of British birds. So um, that was called the British. Oh, I'll just say that. that was called the British bird. But that's my wife giving me coming. Right. Wow. Still there? Yeah, still got you. Yeah. So when um, that was the British Bird Breeders Association, and um, they were they it was a nice society because more emphasis was on breeding. And they would give awards out, medals out for first breedings of certain birds, which I've got a few of those now in my collection, you know. Wow, fantastic. Uh, British bird man um, from Derbyshire um, he brought me his medal and it was for the first breeding of the Willow Warbler from the British Bird Breeders Association in captivity. And I've also got the first breeding of the Goldfinch in captivity. I've got that medal as well in my collection. Um, so they get that, that I like the British bird breeders because it was not all about the three months of showing, it was about what you did for the rest of the year. And, right. um, anyway, um, a bloke named Peter Howe on that society at the time, and Peter asked me to uh, would I go on the inspectors panel uh, during the inception of the um, Countryside and Wildlife Act. Well, because our lads didn't like the thought of bringing birds, 
they didn't like the idea of any of our bird men going on the inspection panel. But I went on because I believed it was important to get bird people on that panel so that when an inspection was done, it was done by bird men rather than inspectors that had never kept a bird in their life and didn't understand you couldn't clean a, um, an aviary out when you'd got, you know, two red yeah. pole goldies or red pole bullies in the nest, you know. Yeah. You know, you it be. So um, there was things we believed that it was important that there was enough bird keepers on there as well as um, protectionists. Oh, most definitely. So I, I, yeah, so I went for that, um, which wasn't didn't go down too well with a few people because they thought you'd turn sides. Well, the reality was you wasn't. You was trying to look after the men properly. Yeah. Uh, also, during that time, we had um, we had three years where we didn't have to close. We, all the birds we had that weren't wrong, were, we had a split ring and a pair of pliers to put a metal split ring around every bird. And we had to yeah. put them on a list and send them into DEFTA. And um, then birds uh, could stay in captivity then with no proof of breeding, no nothing, for them three years. And after that three years, we wouldn't be able to use show them birds anymore. We had to then show birds that were wrong. Um, so going from a, a time where we had no rings on birds to having a time where everything had to be wrong. We only had a three-year cycle to do it. So it was a very bad time for, for us bird keeping. It was, um, but we got over it. And the thing I learned from that was, um, from the days as a young boy going out with catches and things, I did learn that um, we, we, we're very resilient as British men. And uh, if, if we say we can't keep them anymore, we breed them and so make sure we can. And that's why exactly what we did. And we saw, and as we see now, as I look back, we've seen so many species breeding and, and not rejecting rings like happened in them days. We, I keep hearing of ring rejections, but I don't find it off as bad personally. And whether that's because my birds have been bred in captivity a long time, and then birds are now used to seeing that ring on the leg. And they don't yeah. even mind generally that the ring colour changes annually. You know, <laughs> yeah, some, some do, but majority don't because they used to. Um, but that's another story, you know. So I went on that panel and that panel was disbanded eventually. There was a few unscrupulous people on that panel and they, they disbanded it and gave the job to the RSPCA. And made right. it so uh, we lost a little bit of foothold there. So um, well, that yeah. was it. And that was from the British Bird Breeders Association. They've long since gone, unfortunately. Um, and then at that time, I've become um, section representative for the National Exhibition, running the British section at the National, um, at, um, at Bingley Hall, uh, not Bingley Hall, sorry, at the NEC. Hall was right. the biggest state football ground, and we got, you know, lots and lots of birds. The biggest show I ever ran there as show, show manager was 10,000. Um, wow. 10, it's in one hall. And it would take a week to put the staging up. And I had six men and a juggernaut and a forklift truck to put the staging up. And it took a week and then it took two days to mark it out with the class numbers. And um, that was the national. Um, I had 200 stewards. 200 stewards, um, 46 judges, 46 judges, and um, wow. they all had all that to be looked after. So it was that in itself was, was a tremendous job. That, that's um, a massive I, job. I absolutely love that job. Um, yeah. And I, re and I regularly say that was like being asked to be the manager of the England football team. That was, that was, um, to, as going there as a boy and going there, taking my club there later in life and then ending up being the show manager of that show in the end. Um, it was quite, an, you know, for me, it was it was fantastic. It couldn't have been any better. Most and definitely. then I would spend a year here where I am now in my office, just sitting 
preparing for the next show. And the minute it was finished, we started all over again. And, uh, and that's how that one went. So, so I was, um, I, I run the British section for four years and then I was show manager for five or six. Um, and then the very last show we were doing, I was actually the total show organizer running the whole event. And we got it all planned and the animal rights pr protesters stopped that event. Oh, no. And they said keeping birds in cages was not was not the way to go. Um, so we ended up in court, and we were in court in Solly Hall, and we fought that with Cage and Avery. We we sat there for days, you know, to try and get uh, it over to overruled, but we never managed, and the show was eventually cancelled. So if you can imagine sitting here preparing for an event for a year. And two weeks before that set started, having been having a phone call to say, right, stop what you're doing, that's the end of that. And that, and that national has run, I've got stuff here from the national from, from 1890. I've even got videos from 1908 to 1910 uh, of Pathé News of the nationals that run. Um, and yet again, that was another club that had gone by the bottle, well, another show that had gone by the by. So we've had some bad times, you know. Anyway, going on now, I serve on the committee of the National British Bird and Mule Club, staff each of British Bird and Mule Club, and the British Bird Council. Um, I don't attend as much as I can because I'm the alpha now, but uh, I'm still on the end of a phone if you need, if anybody needs me. Yeah. Um, Staffordshire, I do. I still participate quite a lot. And um, I started that club 35 years ago. And uh, that's, we've just had a resurgence. Hopefully we've got a full committee again and we're, we're, we're up and running. So, And, and that's, the next, that's our next show, isn't it, Staffordshire? Yeah. So. Yeah, 16th of January. That's right. So uh, Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well... I'll be there. Yeah, that's awesome. It. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, so you know we're still running, hopefully. And that was a worry up until a month ago, so a couple of months ago. Yeah. So I'm quite pleased that that's. Um, you know, I hope that club keeps going. Oh, definitely. You know, the, best, the best years of that club we had at St Joseph's College, we were getting nearly 800 birds. And um, wow. you know we've seen that drop down now to 500, um, even under sometimes. So uh, it's the whole lobby's a worry at the moment. So uh, we need all you young people to get up there and get involved with these things. Don't we? Definitely and take over so that when we go, we you know you're not going to see what I saw and all see things like the national collapse around. You know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I've judged most specialist shows. Uh, the all the all British I've judged three or four times and. So I've done, I've done most of them, Eastern Fed and London and own counties. And, and so I've judged all of those. Whether I've done a good job, most, some people will tell you no, some people will say yes. That's, that's <laughs> a fact of judging, I'm afraid. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Obviously, I wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. Mules and Hybrids. Um, that was done purely because Mule and Hybrids is my main love, always was. It just so happens as over 50 years, you get not bored, but you want to change and you, you, you go from one place to the other. And that's what's happened to me. So when you look back, you can say, well, you know, it was nice keeping Skylarks. It was lovely breeding 40 chaffinches in one season in, in all <laughs> different colours. And uh, I think even this week I posted one I bred of a white chaffinch. Yeah. Um, and that was a dominant. It seems that I keep coming back to dominant white somehow, uh, you know, or dominant, dominant color. I mean, with the pied greenfinch, for example, and uh, yeah, even the pied bullfinches are very, they recessive, but uh, we're still on the pied. It seems like it's all pied. So. Yeah, well, that that well, that's fantastic hearing the history of it. Um, so I tell you what, while we're on the subject of the pine green finches, then so we've seen you strive regularly yeah. to breed your clear pines, uh, and obviously you've succeeded a number of times. So what do you look for in your pairings? You know, what's the best pairing which you've found produces this the most? Um, 
the best pairing as far as well the, the thing was when i first started most of the birds that you got had only got a small tick mark you'd only got little small marks and, and yeah. uh, you didn't see any light birds like you see today so um there's two trains of thought with this. I see that one of the questions we've got to talk about is whether you lose size when you pair two pies. Well, you do. You do definitely yeah. lose size when you pair pies. Um, but you first of all got to develop a line and you've got to decide where you're going. Depends if you're going for the show line or whether you're going for um, clarity or clearness of a bird. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the standard of which I was part and parcel when we actually did that with Bob Parry said that the standard must be 50 50 uh, green variegation and as, as deep a yellow that you can get. The problem right. is with that bird is to get a clear yellow bird um, and a clear green bird, it can only be a single factor. I don't know if you know, but pies are single and double factors. Yes. And um, so so when you're starting again, it depends whether you're going to go for single factor pies and follow the standard. Um, that standard would mean um, you would have a nice grass green colour with a nice yellow body. And you're obviously trying to get that at 50 50. Yeah. Well, I'll explain what happens. If you put a if you put a, a very light bird to a non-pied bird you'll get them nice markings that are explained in the standard um, now the following season you've then got birds that are all single factors them single yeah. factors are all in the color well you haven't re you haven't removed very much melanin out of the pigmentation and um so but you are creating the pied markings and obviously you're trying to create a trait what we call a trait which is to make the bird all look very similar of evenly more pretty looking birds that are single factors. The minute you pair two of those together to improve yourself, I've, I've found that you've then got a double factor. And the yeah. minute you come on to double factors, the, the green color goes gray. And the yellow, right. the yellow starts to wash out to, 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 to white. So I was left with the decision to make early on as to whether to um, carry on breeding single factors and carry on showing to the standard that me and Bob and some others set originally in the eight in the nineties for the for this new pied greenfinch, because right. that's how they breed cockatiels and that's how they breed zebra finches and lots of other birds. They want a 50-50 good depth of colour. Um, good even depth of colour between both colours. So yeah. it's a green French green and uh, and a nice yellow colour. Obviously, you can't get the yellow colour on a hen because a lot of it tends to wash away with the hens, but the cocks right. would. But as soon as you put two um, yellows together, two single factors together, you've then washed all the green away. So it goes grey. Wow. I don't know if you ever noticed with a pie that a lot of the pie birds, the lighter they get, the, the greyer the green goes. It's not a green anymore. It's a grey. Uh, so these right. lines that show you a bird that's bred off a top quality exhibition, normal greenfinch, you'll get the size, but you won't get the you don't get the colour. In the first year of breeding with a pie, you will get the colour. But then if you want to announce and you do the same thing again, you've then bred double factors and you've washed all your green away to grey. Uh, but the right, birds will wow. start to get lighter. Yeah. So it's a, um, it's a catch 22. Some breeders at that point will go normal to pied, then to yeah. pied, and then back to normal. And that way you can maintain your size a little bit. But you lose it on the second year, but you pull it back on the third year. So then we've created another problem oh, yeah. that we're putting melanin colour back in by going back to normal. Yeah. And uh, and that's how the pied goes continually until I got to the point that I thought I can't. If I want to produce a winner, I go out and buy a good quality green finch, I buy a nice light pied and put them together, and I'll breed a bird capable to show. 
Uh, yeah. What I did find, and this is only what I find, I mean, I'd like to know if other people find it differently, but um, I found that then your size starts to drop the more you go five to five, and um, your, your size, and, and the depth of color of the green gets reduced. After yeah. about eight years, I produced some, uh, some, and they were nearly all buffs when I started, but eventually red and yellow. And I eventually got to a point where I was putting yellow to buff when I was double factoring each time. So I worked yeah. on the fact that I wanted to clear the bird altogether and make the bird make it completely clear. And, right. Um, yeah. And so that's what we did. And um, if you uh, if you look at this bird, if you look at this bird, um, this was bred this year. And that's a clear buff wow. hen. That's a clear buff hen, but the clear bird isn't the one at the front. The clear bird's the one at the back. Right. Got you, you can yeah. See just around the just around the cheek. There's yeah. a little bit of black on that first bird. So slightly ticked then, isn't she? That's yeah. slightly ticked, very, very slightly, but it is still ticked. But its sister, its sister is completely clear. But well, they're both the same way bred, both yeah. 2021 birds, both black eyed, of course, and uh, they're both buffs. You know, well, I, 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 they're looking buffs, to be honest, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. So that was this year's breeding. And um, some of the birds along the way, um, some of the birds along the way is, um, I don't know if I have to keep screen sharing. There again, can you see the slight suffusion marks on the neck? Yes. Wow. So there's still some slight variegated marks on the neck of that bird. But we've got the we've kept the yellow. We've now gone from a buff bird to a yellow bird. And, That's um, fantastic. Yeah, and what we're wow. doing is with the Lutino, I don't know if you've ever noticed, you don't get that rich yellow colour with the Lutino. It's no. very hard. Most most Lutinos are nearly white now. And um, many have tried, and we've had a few real good ones. I think I remember Barry Basmozis showed one that won everywhere. There was a couple of others that have been shown that have done really well. But most most Lutinos, albeit the red-eyed, um, they haven't got that intensity of colour. So the pied did a lovely job. So that was another reason for me to, um, that was another reason for me to try and, um, and, and the first, the first pie that I bled, the first clear pie that I bred um, was this bird. And, yeah. Um, have you got that one? Yeah, wow, that look one? at that. Yeah, so that was the first one that I bred. And that one, I decided I've got to show because it was the first one I'd ever seen. And um, you, you get conflicting marks on the internet because you keep seeing odd birds, but the reality is half of them are Lutinos and Lutino crosses and they put in Lutinos in that. And, and I didn't want to, I needed to know where my birds were coming from. So there's no Lutino been anywhere near these birds. Um, and uh, again, that's a black eyed. And that bird won at the old British, it won um, best on flighty colour bearing. But it wasn't that's shown fun. in the pied class. This is where we come on now, because it wasn't shown in the pied class. It was shown as um, uh, a clear, as a clear in the any other variety class. Right, because okay. Putting it in the pied class would, um, if I put that bird in the pied class, it would be wrong class because I was yeah. responsible as much as anybody else for that by saying a pie had to be 50-50. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and now I realise that um, that's that's the exhibition standard, and that's what we that's what we must judge to. Yeah. But um, getting birds like this is, is means the bird isn't isn't a pie at all. It's a it's a variegated. Fantastic. And I believe that. I believe that these birds are actually variegated and not pied. Um, they're, they're brilliant. So um, was, that a, was that a yellow? 
That was, was the that yellow. Him? That was the yeah. cock. Right. And Matt Cock is um, he's four year old now, and uh, well, he, yes, he'd be coming up to five this time. So the object is do a pair into that buff end that you've just seen, or yeah. into both those buff ends you've just seen. But well, what you do get is you obviously get a, a drop in the size. Yeah. Because you're not putting normals in. But if you've just spent like me 16 years trying to produce birds like this, and I've got put a normal in straight into a line, I, it's a difficult decision to make because I'm going to lose five years of the work I've done. I'm yeah. going to go backwards for five years, then we start again. So I yeah. started to think at the time my best way would be to um, to breed these birds for um, the way they are and breed as many as I could. And there was there was the years where I was turning 90 of these out, 89. And, wow. um, <laughs> you know, a varying variegations, obviously. But yeah. what I could do then is, because I was breeding volume, you could it was natural selection. So I kept the clearest and the, and the biggest. Um, but you know, you do lose the size, and I'm at that point at this moment where really I need to put some good normals back in. But the minute I do that, I'm scared that I so I'm running a few normals now alongside Dave Hammond yeah. helped me out with a bird. Um, um, there's a couple of lads helped me out with a bird, um, just so that I can run them alongside with a pied single factors. Till I'm happy, yeah. I've got enough mounting out, but kept the size up a bit. But obviously, each time I put a pipe back in, we lose size again. Yeah. So I don't know where we'll go from there. I don't know where we'll go from there. I've stopped right. showing them. I've stopped showing them really because um, they're too important for me to. The first one I had to show for a few shows, it got a bit skittish after that, so I, I didn't show it again. But it's okay now it sits as steady as a rock, but is it worth risking a bird on a show to win a rosette when it's uh, the mainstay is still? Yeah, well, I'm going to say it's a special bird, isn't it? So you can't really oh, put that at risk. Time. Um, wow. I'll just show you one more and then we'll move on from that if you want to. I don't want yeah, to. yeah, of course, no problem. Of your time. Yeah. But um, that's Christopher with one in his hands. Oh, wow. wow, that's a young bird, you know. Now that bird never reached matu maturity. Oh, right. I've bred two or three like that that were completely clear, and um, with going light and things like that, I've lost a few. Um, oh. I did lose one with an eye problem because you do get the odd eye problems with the lighter pipes. Um, right. So oh, I lost yeah. that as well. So um, you know, I have bred four or five. Well, you've just seen the two best, and I still um, have those two. So yeah, um, yeah. I'm hoping for one last year with the yellow cock, albeit he's been around probably 50% of the hens in this in my setup. He's in there somewhere, you know, he's in the yeah. line to the point oh, that uh, this year I actually the bird we showed in the first place, um. That bird, the young bird that we showed, you know, I'll just show you this one. Yeah. This young bird that um, this is it in just as it's left its parents, well, it's still with its parents. There you go. Can you see wow, that one? Look at that. Yeah. Now that's, um, now that was bred off as a normal, a large normal cock with a, wow. um, Sorry, a large normal hen, uh, yeah. no pied in it whatsoever, to a 70-30 um, uh, pied. 70% clear, 30% yeah. dark. And is that a completely clear bird, this one? That's completely, absolutely clear, not a mark on it anywhere. Fantastic. Yeah. What what a brilliant result getting actually you know clears out of, of those darker birds as well. That's the that's the thing that worries me about now. Um Dave Googlin's question was uh, do I think we lose size? Yes, I do. Um in the same context, I think when we had a normal, we lose pied. Yeah. So this bird has just totally shown me something else because it's bred off a normal with a 
70% clear double factor uh, cock and uh, it's produced a full clear. So that's, now out of that nest, it produced the clear, it produced the bird I showed you before with a little bit on the side of the face, on the cheek. Yeah, yeah. And um, the cheek marks are the hardest to remove. Uh, the colours are very hard to move. But it, what it does show me is that, um, oh, sorry, so there was them two, there was a 50-50 dark. Yeah. Um, show, because he was, he was still quite dark. And uh, and two fully yellow greens, very bright, vivid yellow greens, um, with just a little teeny mark on the nest. So wow. that was a mix nest of five. So uh, that was a nice that's sample mating. The second round, she produced me one, so I was a bit disappointed because this, this was the first round, and uh, you actually see this bird being rung. On the uh, when we spoke well, when I did a video with Matt on uh, yeah on his channel, and that bird was wrong that day on that video. Um, but it's come from an all. It's come from a normal cross with a double factor pie. So that, uh, that's that's a brilliant result, isn't it? Like, yeah, well, well, just well done. I'm, that's amazing. What what it's telling me is that's that it. perhaps if I do add an odd normal in. I can keep the pie going, but whether whether down the line that will start to go bad on me, again, it's all just guesswork. But uh, yeah, we'll see what that bird produces because the, the fact remains is we may have put a lot of melanin back into that bird uh, in his genes, but on the other hand, it may still stay clear and we might still breed some lights next year, which will do me good because I've been able to put a normal outcross in without... Um, Keeping the dark birds, you know, yeah. but the dark birds I've now sold on because um, they they're not fit for purpose for me really. But I'm still a bit concerned really that if I'd got the room, I should have kept them because what happens if they throw another clear out? You know. Yeah, I guess they could do, but yeah, I guess well, you, can't, you can't keep everything. Have the can people you? that have had them will let me know if they do. And, yeah, <laughs> well, birds need to be here, not somewhere else. So, yeah, I know what you mean. That's, well, that... the pie, that's the pie, really. Um, yeah, you know, people. I keep, I keep hearing on forums on the internet where people say, um, "This bird is a what do they call it? a carrier." There's no such thing as a carrier to pie. No, and I exactly. Don't know where they keep, I don't know where they keep having that from, but uh, if a bird's got white toenails, it's a pie. If it's got yeah. white toenails, it's not coloured anywhere. I get rid of it. It's of no use. It would take 10 generations to turn that bird into anything of any use. Yeah. It could be of use if it's big with white toenails, as, as uh, what we call a, pie, a dark pied, yeah. to put in with a lighter bird to keep the size and the, and the strength of the colour. You know, so, Absolutely. Um, so that's where they are useful. But generally, they're not of much use. And there's no such thing as pied in hiding, which I've heard it called as, or, or yeah. you know, or, or even um, carrier for pied. Exactly. It's pied, pied, yeah, pied is dominant. So it has to, it's either pied or it's not. There's no such thing yeah. as carrier. So exactly. yeah, I think, I think people get it mixed up with sex links sometimes and then that's, that's where right. it can get confusion in there. But I mean, thank you for showing us all that. I mean, that's fantastic. So I mean, if we talk about your whole finches now, um, you know, um, quite, quite, quite a special bird, aren't they? So um, yeah. you've bred whole finches in the past. And at, at one point, at least, on what I saw the other day, you had a, a, a good sized stud of them. Um, what would be your advice on someone starting out with whole finches? Well, first of all, where you get your birds from, because that's the difficult thing today. Diffic very difficult to get hold of. Um, there is a big section on my website on my breedings and that yeah. shows the line of chaffinches that are bred in all colours and it goes on to that. And it also shows the mules that I, I've played around with, you know. So, um, right. but the whole finches, I, I, I had my own mix. I had my own mix of all finches. It was, um, it was a good British finch mix with, um, with safflower added and uh, I used to use a mixed millet 
I once right. remember going to a tour to um, cage bird societies were quite good in a way because you had talks with foreign bird keepers, budgie man, um, canary man, all that learn different things than we do as British men. And some of the foreign men are very clever. They breed finches in the same way as we breed finches, albeit the finches we wouldn't keep particularly. Yeah. Um, and so some of the techniques they used when I've been to their talks, they were useful when I've organized talks for them at CBS Cage Bird Show. Um, yeah. They were very interesting. And um, one of them used to tell me about millets being a very milky seed. Budgery gauze rear on millet, most mainly. And uh, wow. so do a lot of the zebra finches, Bengalese. So I started adding a bit into my finch mix. And um, over time, when I started breeding the whores, I gave them quite a bit. Because they're not really a soft food lover. Um, so I right. give them a nice milky seed. So I would buy a millet conditioner, which I got all different sorts of millets in, and uh, mix that with a good quality British finch and um, and safflower. And I didn't give I give sunflower and safflower. Yeah. And uh, of course the old finch beak could cope with them very easy. And um, where you'd get your birds from, I, I really don't know today because uh, there is a few lads still breeding a few. And um, hopefully, you know, that they'll start to get easier to breed. I, I started breeding them for one reason, and that was to breed myself some spare ends to put with a crossbill to try and be the first person to breed a crossbill hawfinch. Oh, I don't believe the crossbill, the hawfinch cock will ever breed personally. I think he's like the bullfinch cock. But, I'm sure the um, I'm sure the um, the hen would. Yeah. And I find with a pair, what you want in a pair of orphans is you want um, you want the hen to be dominant. Right. If the cock's dominant, he knocks her about quite a lot. When the hen's dominant, she she knocks the cock around, so he keeps out of her road. Um, but eventually, she decides she wants to breed, and she lets him in. And uh, and I find that pairing worked well for me. And I've bred, you know, I've bred seven or eight off one pair in a season. And, um, and I know lads, but that's the way I, the only the way I found it. But if, it, if the hen was dominant, it was a bit easier than if the cock was dominant because he would hurt her. Got um, you. Oh. I always pair my birds up in the winter. And, yeah. If, if you saw my birds on that picture the other day, um, they were in adjoining cages. They were only in there for the winter, the young birds. And what happens then is they would be paired up while they were out of condition. And I preferred to do it that way. Pair them up out of condition and then um, leave them in over the bad winter and then put them out in February or March. All my apiaries are covered with duplex sheeting, so um, they never really get the full weather anyway. Um, yeah. And some have got glass fronts on as well, as well as mesh and glass on the front that I can take off in the as the summer gets yeah. warmer. You undo four turn catches and lift the the glass out, and it's yeah. non-breakable glass. You know this um, laminated, it's called, I think, and right. I can lift all those glass panels out. So birds could stay out in the winter, but I prefer to bring them in from my point of view. I can control the freezing of the water and I aren't running up and down all the time. And since I've been bad with my breathing, it's easier to uh, it's easier to uh, keep control everything inside for the winter. And then I would put the females out first yeah. and uh, a week or two before and then add the males, which is what I tend to do with most birds if I can anyway. Um, Brilliant. That way it gives the female chance to get fit after being in a little cage over winter and she's yeah. flying about quite well. Then let the cock out and he's a little bit slower than her and she can get out of the road just for a few weeks until uh, till they were acclimatised to one another again. Yeah. And, and I didn't have a lot of problem with rejection. Problems Fantastic. I did get with all finches was um, you could rear them and then once once the, the once the young birds come out, I once had five in the nest. In fact, there's still a video knocking around on YouTube somewhere with some babies in the 
and there was five in, the, in that nest originally. And um, I turned me back on them and, and the father had come down, seen two of them were cocks and killed both the cocks. He didn't kill the hens, the three hens, but he killed both cocks as quick as that. Now they were all right in the nest. Yeah. Um, yeah. What he did was, he didn't kill them as regards straight out kill them. He stopped, he refused to feed them. Oh, wow. And the hen went straight down, like you'll see with a lot of birds, um, like red poles. You'll, you'll probably see that with red poles. The hen goes oh, yeah. the and leaves the babies to be reared by the father. And the hawfinches were doing the same. But the minute um, that they, they were, you could tell they were, because you can tell the cocks and hens very quickly yeah. with the finches. Um, and then he left the cocks to die. As if he'd said, I'm not feeding them, the cocks, they shouldn't be here. But he carried on a feather, you know. And I had that a couple of times. So uh, they can do yeah. some little quirks with those. Um, but what I did find, if you could rear them to four days, and this was in the early days when I liked hand rearing, um, because right. it saved birds and, you know, it saved you buying birds. Only when I realised they don't breed as well as um, parent reared birds that I stopped doing it. But uh, with the hawfinches, I didn't. I carried on doing it. And, I, and what I found was, um, what I found was slowly but surely, um, I ended up with more Andrea birds than I've got Avery bred birds. Because at four days, I could take them away. I could feed them on a, on a good hand rearing formula. And I use yeah. Hagen Tropican, which is a hand rearing form powder. You bite in one kilos or yeah. five kilos. And they would rear on that alone without any live food or anything. And they were good, big, strong, healthy birds. And uh, I could rear them on that. And uh, it was a cheaper way of rearing them because trying to give enough mealworms and especially wax moths to uh, to all finches, they could eat wax moths for fun when they're rearing a nest of five babies. You know, wow. They do have so, to yeah. Is it just insects then for hawfinches when rearing? Um, no, they still take seed, but they do feed mainly on, on uh, live food, mealworms, right. and uh, they eat very little else. Perhaps today I'd give them peas, but I didn't have them in the days when we really bothered. I used to give them broccoli and carrot mixed in with the egg food, but I yeah. never give peas. Now, now I'd probably give peas, you know, as well. Right. And, uh, there's some good enough greenfinch mixes. Though well, I would probably just give them a standard greenfinch mix now. But yeah. I would always add a bit of millet, just because I, I, you know, I do feel it can be a useful seed. Oh, definitely. Um, so, and, and, yeah. yes. But before so, you get to four days, yeah. I realised I could rear them then, no problem. Yeah. But up to four days, I struggled. Some people I've heard breed them. I've heard people say they put them under bullfinches. An odd one, oh, right. old finch and red one. Well, I'm, you know, I, I, I would have never tried that. But, uh, yeah. Did you ever try fostering them out? No, no, never. No. Uh, right. When okay. You got as, when you've got us about eight or nine pairs of old finch, yeah, I never got room to have crossbills or anything that might, you know, if possibly yeah. crossbills would do it today. I don't know. Okay, well, that, that's interesting. So, when it comes to um, preparing them for the breeding season, what are you conditioning them on? Um, well, as I say, the, I don't mainly. I think lights are one of the biggest issues. You've got to right. get the birds, you know, um, get the light properly. Make sure that lights are not on till all hours at night time. I know that's difficult with men that go to work. I've always yeah. been lucky. I've worked from home, so I've been able to deal with deal with my birds in the day. But a lot of people tend to um, have to have lights on till late, come in and have yeah. their evening meal, and then go do the birds. I think the yeah. best way of that is the, the lads that get up early and feed in the morning. But, um, so I think lights the most important, and uh, yeah. as with conditioning, I just give them the wax moths. And, uh, and the normal seed, give them wax moths and obviously dip them in calcium powder because yeah. um, wax moths have got no calcium in them whatsoever. And as they feed, as they'll feed on mealworms and wax moths fully, 
you need to get some calcium and that speaks for anything from wagtails to anything else yeah you need that extra calcium you know absolutely yeah no secrets no um nothing special you just start to increase the bit of live food they don't need live food you don't need to pile it on they will eat the rc eaters it's generally when they've got babies where you you've then got to up the quantity right. and that's when you see the pound signs running away because <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> wax yeah. Moths are just you, you you then realize why people charge what they charge for for wax for, for whole pictures, you know yeah exactly i mean imagine the cost probably uh, you know a lot of money per bird just on on that uh, live feed yeah. like you say as young as you hand it if you hand yeah. it, it, it it's cost you four or five pounds for a, raising a nest of youngsters just giving yeah. you the odd tip of a wax moth um yeah it's very cheap to rear, <laughs> but i don't find i have had andrea birds that bred and yeah. uh, some some that were very good mothers but in general that's how i lost my stud in the end because i was andrea more and more and more to make sure i've got enough and uh, didn't lose any i was getting very proficient at it to the point where you know 21 22 or three in one season was good um i was quite happy with that and you need to breed that quantity if you're keeping six or eight pairs because you do have losses as well and birds get older and you need to keep swapping um but what i did find was like i say that they uh, you know they um you slowly yeah. but surely they start breeding on you because they're all under it. Right. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, fair you, enough. Uh, I them. guess, yeah. And then the yeah. pride green came <laughs> for me and off we went again, you see? Yeah. Um, right. So, what sort of flight are you putting? What would you put the all finches in? Yeah, my all finches are all in 6 p 3s uh, Right. I don't know if you've seen my videos, you've not been here, but. Um, I've got a, a block of Avery's called Hall Finch Close. Yes. And there's a there's a street sign on or everybody has the photo taken next to Hall Finch Close. And then next to the sign when I was keeping all finches. Every time that somebody called me say, Can I have a picture taken with you know, yeah, of course you can. And oh, brilliant. Uh, just because, you know, and that used to be full. And there's a, there's a block of ten Avery's in there. And uh, right. well, there's 13 Avery's in that one block. There's 13 in that one block, but uh, there's 10 6P3s, um, one oh, 6P6. Brilliant. Yeah. And there was an off round Avery where I've read the Skylarks and that, if you've ever been on my website and seen some of that breeding. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. That's okay. it. But what I've done with that off round now is split that into three separate Avery's again. Yeah. Because I, I find yeah. that I prefer breeding single pairs, but, but I like to have pairs around. And I think most yeah. people would have one pair of all finches. Um, we were talking about this the other day. And, and, and I think colony breeding is probably the way. One or two people said online that they would actually um, bred them in a colony. I've never done that, but I've always had them in here shot of each other. Yeah. I think if yeah. one pair can see another or hear another, that helps. Um, and really? I've always liked to do that breed. If I'm breeding chaffinches, I'll have six or eight pairs of chaffinches. If I'm breeding whole finches, six or eight pairs of oars. And, and the same with any, because I think when you've got eight to ten pairs of the same species, uh, A, you can transfer babies easier. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. Put something else down on eggs. And secondly, yeah. um, you know, if, if one mother stops feeding, you can move eggs easier to, you know, and shunt things around. Oh, definitely. So all these things can be, um, you know, can be done. Can be done. It's, yeah. Uh, that, that would be interesting, colony breeding. I think definitely something some, you know, people should try because they might have a hell of a lot more success with that. And then, you know, they'll yeah. become a readily available thing. I mean, I'd love some half inches, but trying to source them, you know, the, that no one's barely anyone's got them. Um, that's right, it's a real shame. Um, Even in the days, wow. in the days when I was keeping them, which is that's 20 years ago, and I had them for a good 10 years or more. Um, they were quite not easy to get hold of then, 
but there was availability yeah. and there was people breeding them. And, yeah. Uh, you just don't seem to see them now, you know, the same way. No. Oh, well, I guess I, hopefully they'll bounce back and, um, you know, and, and people will manage to get some numbers out. That's what so. would be nice, wouldn't it, you know? Absolutely. Um, so we'll we'll go on to a bit on the the, the show side of, of things now. So, uh, what, what's what's the best bird that you can remember seeing at a show that you wanted to come home with? Um, I think I'm probably best showing you a couple of pictures of this one so, because um, there's many, many, many. As I've been to most shows over the last fifty years, that's that's been I could name birds forever in a day. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I've seen the first breedings come along and um, of the mules and hybrids and things like that. So uh, it's a difficult one. But having had that question early and, and had a look at it, yeah. Um, the first one I would pick would be um, would be this bird. And that's wow. Walter Jones is uh, clear mule. And yeah. Won the national. Won everything for a few years. That bird. I mean, he won the national twice. And I was lucky enough to uh, be with him the day when he won that one. So you know, it was uh, that's a goldie mule. Yeah, that, so that that's just fantastic. Yeah, that's the ultimate in goldfinch mule. And uh, there's nobody that wouldn't uh, accept that bird as being um, probably one of the best they've ever seen, you know. Yeah. Um, and to win the national twice, uh, he actually then did it with a red pole bully. So he, he, he won the Supreme Award. And you've got to remember in them days, you, if you won the Supreme Award, you were all over the front cover of Cage Birds the next day. And... Um, wow. You, you own the front cover of Cage Birds that day, holding up the Hayden Silver Challenge trophy. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic uh, achievement. In fact, while we were just talking about that. Uh, I mean, I've seen... That That's us as organisers at the National with a film star, the blonde-haired girl. She's a motorbike rider. I don't know what she... She's been on the tally. She was a presenter. Every year we had a different person, but she was a TV presenter. And there's all the trophies. And you'll see just yeah. across the back behind that lad, the biggest one, that's the Hayden Silver Challenge trophy for best exhibit. And there's me, Mick Younger, standing there at the side. Um, yeah, yeah. You know... TV cameras there and everything, and that's how big the national used to be. That um, wow, that's amazing. And you used to stand there and have your photo taken and be handed the best supreme, award, what was called the supreme award, and um, and that was um, that was all, all over. You were the full size, full full cover of the Cage and Avery birds the next day, the next week. Oh, superb! Wow, that that's was, just amazing. Yeah. Wow. That, you know, don't get me wrong, we, we've still got a national. It's something, it's better than nothing. But uh, unfortunately, for people like me, it's uh, it's not the same, you know. We, yeah. And it's only down to young people to make it that again. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. what. Uh, well, I, 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 yeah. I, I'll be on the mission. Know. Yeah, I'll be on the mission and that's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Well, you now know. you've learned how to steward because I saw you there working away. Yeah. And now yeah. you're learning how to do that. You know, who knows? Before long, you might be running Staffish instead of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd love to, to do stuff like that and, and make well, a there difference. You go. This, bird, oh, look at that. this bird was, um, we don't see many, you know, we don't see many red pot bullies. But I want to remember seeing, I think there were seven in the old British. And I've seven. never seen seven in one year in my life. Um, so that was a that was a fantastic day that day to see seven of these in one yeah. show. Um, a friend of mine, Nick Booth, 
he was a member of Staffordshire. He, he worked for us at the show and he was, a, he was one of our lads. He, he actually bred it a yellow one, which was, to me, was probably one of the best I've seen. But uh, this was Les Rogers's from Yorkshire. Right. And uh, Les won Supreme Award with this bird and he died straight after. Wasn't looking too well at the National, but he did one every show up until the National. And when he went to the National, he won, but he was not looking very well. But uh, oh, wow. that, that was another special bird for me. Not particularly this one, but the, the species, because um, it's a phenomenal hybrid. And uh, I've bred them on two occasions and never reared them. Oh, really? So wow. uh, it really hurts me to think that, you know, when people say, well, what have you ever bred? Well, I nearly did. But then that's a, that's a fisherman's story, isn't it? You know? Yeah. It's oh, a fisherman's wow. story. I nearly <laughs> did. Yeah, um, always the one that got away. <laughs> yeah, one of my favourite birds is, um, I'll get, instead of showing you the bird, I'll show you the man, because this man was was brilliant, this man was. He was um, he was a lovely man. He wasn't particularly, the, you know, the, um, the breeder, but he didn't half get a bird ready for a show. And uh, oh, brilliant. he had some wonderful hybrids in his time. And he's probably won as much as anybody. And he was a gentleman, and he worked um, he worked hard for the fancy. And he was always there helping me at the National. He was helping the British Bird Council. He'd come meetings, he supported every show. And he, was, he lived a good way off, and he was still there at the end, helping pack the stage in a way before he left to go home. Now, there's not Brilliant. many of them people about. There's plenty that moan. Because they haven't, you know, the rosettes are the wrong colour, or but there's not many that will stop and help you at the end to make sure that we have a show again the next year. They're quite happy to walk away and leave you. But this man never did. Right. And he never took a prize money either. He always put it back in. So when he went to pick his envelope up, he'd just throw them at me and say, you know, and that money come back in again. But, you know, John Broadbent's the man. And, brilliant. Uh, that's his greeny chaffy. That looks brilliant. Look at that. And if you look in that day as well, <laughs> it actually got uh, one of my rosettes on there. Yeah, I just noticed that, man. Yeah, that's it's right. Super, so. isn't it? And um, wow. Yeah, and then we we designed this other one, which was another little rosette, and had the logo on, and uh, they were quite popular after a while. We used to give them for first, second, and third as well. But, right. but that was the bramble, famous bramble chaffinch. That's the, you know, yeah. that is one hell of a bird. And, oh my uh, God. You want to see the bird just on its own. Um, there's the bird just on its own. Yeah. There he goes. Look at that. Greeny chaffy. So, what an amazing yeah, bird. Yeah, so that was the greeny chaffy. Now, I've seen a lot of greeny chaffies. And that makes the difference. I think when you've had birds a long time, you don't judge based on the one that's in front of you. You can, only, yeah. you can judge based on what you've seen in 50 years. Um, you do, we do judge on a comparison in this country. So yeah. it's very easy for somebody to put a picture up and say, look at this load of rubbish that's won this show. But unless you've seen the other load of rubbish that's in as well, very difficult for anybody to make comment. This is where the internet's bad to me because it's very easy to put a bird up now and say, um, look at that, Why did, how did that manage to win the show? Well, we need to see the others in the class to realize why it won. Yeah. It doesn't always mean, when you're judging by comparison, you can only judge what's in front of you. Yeah. And I always say to people like you, if they come to me and say, if you're going to buy a green finch, take your best green finch with you. In a showcase, in a number three, not a number two, in a number three, because people will put some in a number two for you to look at, like they do on the internet when you're looking at it. And you won't be able to stand your bird there and say, I'm after a hen for this cock. What you're doing is you're looking, you, you then get your comparison to look at what other birds are being offered you. Because yeah. believe me, believe me not, you'll get home and take a bird thinking you've just bought, you've picked the best one in his shed because he's offered you 
all birds and you pick the one and you get it home and it's, it's not as good as the bird you've already got. No, yeah. I mean, something different about that bird, which I noticed compared compared to some of the other greenish chaffies, is the is the the, the wing the, the white bar on the shoulder. I've not seen that on a greenish chaffie before. And it was bright yellow. That was really bright yellow. And it was wow. very very wide. And the bird was big as well because it was an old bird as well. In the end, it was shown for a lot of years, so it become experienced. And that's yeah. another thing novices don't do. They, they try a bird one season and then think that's no good, get rid of it. Birds get better each year and, and build a bit of size and they also become experts at being shown. So yeah. uh, even they enjoy in the end, when you've had a bird a few years, it enjoys being put in a cage because it knows it's going out. Just like the dog does when you take it for a walk. Yeah. Um, and the and, and problem is with novices, they just assume that bird's no good, get rid of it, move on, and then be back to square one again. Yeah. So that's another thing to... Uh, so that bird's another one of my favourites. And this one was an all-time favourite of a very nice man, great right. man in the hobby. Um, died too young, this man did. He was uh, far too young when he died and quite sad. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Derek Gold know this was. This was his Bramble Finch cock. Obviously, you don't get the jet black head because we don't show. That's why a lot of British shows used to be held in February, March. Yeah. Because you're trying to get these birds at the right breeding condition. Why things like snow buntings don't shout, you know, they're not in the best condition during our show season. But the workings under there and the spots underneath that bird were second to it's probably one of the best birds I've ever seen. But that, uh, that's just stunning. Certainly the best bramble finch I've ever seen. So when you've seen birds like that and you've got them imprinted in your head because you've seen them week after week, uh, when yeah. somebody puts one up and you look at it and you make no comment, it's not that you're being nasty, you're just you're comparing it to the to what you've seen for the best, which you know. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's no good. It just means you think to yourself, well, still not as good as Derek's side, you know. So yeah. when you start ranting over a bird, then you then realize, yeah, this must be good. It's the best one I've ever seen. And that one was one of them for me. Absolutely. I mean, that's just a stunning bird, bird that. It's like that, is the and that he's photo to to start with. So, yeah, so that's another one. That that's great. Thank you very much. So just on that with the shows then, um, is there any show standards you'd change? Is there anything that you think we've got wrong? Well, I think, yeah, the pied, would be, the pied greenfinch would be the one that I'd really change. Um, because, again, we, 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 we've set that as being a pied greenfinch, and I don't believe it's a pied greenfinch, I believe it's a variegated. So right. as it's variegated, the pied is only one, one little spectrum of that bird. You yeah. can have lightly variegated, heavily variegated, three parts dark. Canaries have the whole range, and I believe this is the start of that. This is where canaries yeah. were bred from originally, and this is why I work with them, because I believe the canary being a, a green serine type finch, and it was turned to white by a lot of people that were selling them as, didn't have radios in them days, they used to have a bird in the living room singing. Because yeah. there was a lot of breeders and this, this light bird started appearing, not like me, where there's only a few of us trying to breed these. They everybody wanted to breed these birds because they could charge a penny more for them in the marketplace. And yeah. um, they quickly bred a yellow canary. And over 50 years or more, they bred a yellow canary in all the different colours. And, yeah. Um, and that's what I've been trying to do with this with this pied greenfinch, which isn't a pied greenfinch. It's a dominant greenfinch. It's a it's actually a yellow greenfinch, you know. Yeah. And and in clear form, lightly marked, dark marked. And at the right. moment, we're only catering for single factored 50-50 birds. Yeah. And all the rest of the birds are no use. Right. So, so do, do you think then it'd be a case of of renaming it variegated greenfinch and then dividing that, you know, it has its own separate sort of thing in, like you say, like canaries, yeah. you know, ticks, 
fifty percent dark and and all this to to cater yeah. for a, a range of. Yeah. yeah. The problem is with that, of course, me being on committees and running schedules and and doing all those sorts of things. Yeah. We we'd never fill the classes. We'd end up with too many classes and too few birds. So we've yeah. either got to re rethink what we show them as and, and lump the lot together, whether it be pies, whether it be single factor, double factor, or whatever, and let them be judged on their own merit. Um, yeah. you know, so that's that's how I feel with the pied, because right. if we had 20 classes for pied green finches, I mean I once run with Staffy Chew, we organized the very first all greenfinch show. And we ran a show, and there's pictures there, I could have shown you, but we weren't probably where it's at. Um, of the first all greenfinch show where we only had a show with greenfinches and greenfinches and their hybrids. So we had wow. red pole greenies, siskin greenies, you know, anything, anything that in fact John Broadbent won that with that greeny chaffy. And uh and that was Allen in Stoke here, right on Junction 16. And we had that show, everybody attended, but they could only bring greenfinches or greenfinch hybrids. So it was a very good show. We only run them one, because we didn't want to split the hobby. We weren't trying to split the hobby. We just, we just yeah. were playing around and thought, it would, let's see how, how well a greenfinch show would do on its own. That's brilliant. Um, and that, we did it. That's brilliant. So that was a yeah. one-off. And um, yeah. Um, wow. And the other thing I would like to do is I, I find some of the classifications of the hybrids, like, for example, crossbill hybrids. Yeah. Um, you cannot compare a crossbill, uh, say, a red pole crossbill with a common, the same as you can bred uh, with, a, you know, with a parrot or with a Scottish, yeah. three different birds. As we go yeah. for size, its size is dependable upon the species that it's bred with. So if you're crossing a hybrid and you've got a parrot crossbill, it's going to win every single time. But it yeah. shouldn't. It shouldn't because if we knew that there was a that, that was bred off a common crossbill, you know. Um, yeah. And I've shown i shown um, crossbill canaries in cinnamon crossbill canaries. And um, normal crossbill canaries, they're in my book on the front. When you open the front cover, there's an unflighted one there. And on the very front cover, there's a, an unflighted one. And um, they were they was bred off a common. But that year, Don Footy bred the most wonderful parrot crossbill canary. That wasn't yeah. as my colour was as good as the most intense red fatty you could get off a common. But Don Fortich was as big as you could get off a big parrot. And so my bird never got a look in up for, for three seasons if Don turned up. But if Don right. didn't turn. So size goes more over uh, over colour. Right. Um, okay. So yeah. do, do you think there's too much focus on the uh, crossbill and bullfinch hybrids and it's sort of neglecting the side of it for I don't know, green finch, red pole hybrids and stuff. Yeah, I think I think you cross when you look at the the, the main hybrids that win are red pole bullies, cross bills, um, the sorry, red pole bullies and canary bullies, greeny bullies. There's that select few that, that seem to win shows. And what we're finding now is the entries of hybrid mules and hybrids are going down because um, what's the point? If you haven't got a canary yeah. cross bill, why take it? So yes. The way to do that is give more awards away. And we've started to give awards away at Staffordshire for best Linny, best Red Pole, best Siskin, to try and encourage people to bring them birds along and swell the Siskin classes. Because let's be honest, not very often does a Siskin, unless it's one like Paul Meek showed the other week, you know, a lovely yellow bird. And unless, yeah. unless it's birds like that, they very rarely win best in show. So, yeah. um, and, and that happens with the mules and hybrids. You know, your greeny red poles don't stand a chance. Now, 50 years ago, when I was going to All British, um, and I was going down at Garrington's and places like that, social club in the West Midlands, there would be 50 to 100 mules and hybrids for sale in the sales classes. Wow. And as a novice, I could go down there and buy myself a show team. 
yeah. and different birds to film the shed, same as you do now. You go, I'll have that, I've never kept that, I'll have this. And it was like being in a toffee shop. And um, some fantastic little mules and hybrids. Um, but nowadays, yeah. nobody seems to bother quite so much. And if they did, they don't win. So to encourage them people to bring the birds out, we need to somewhere um, give them something, you know. Yeah, um, so to, it would be a case of sort of um, expanding the, the specials awards to catering for those more, um, you know, just different ones, I guess the, the, the point is, isn't yeah, it? It's I think, different. I think in Ireland, in Ireland, when I've ever been over there and I've judged or whatever, they do cater more for the small, you know, they yeah. do cater yeah. quite a lot for the small um, hybrids and, and, and mules. Whereas in England, we don't seem to do it. We give one award for best mule or hybrid one, for, you know, and, and that's all we give. Whereas yeah. there's a lot of miniatures and uh, we don't really cater for. In fact, they frowned on in this country. We've always right. tried to put a trophy on for best miniature to try and encourage it. Doesn't always yeah. work. Whereas in Ireland, you see some absolutely stunning um, sesky mules and goldfinch mules um, in in large numbers. So yeah. uh, we, we miss out there, really. And we're not right. encouraging people to do it. So to be just the case of changing it slightly on the show, you know, with, with the shows to, to to give that option for people to encourage it, those. That would do it, but unfortunately, it all costs money. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and, and, it, it, and this time this year we've increased our entry fee to a pound a bird, and some people might say that's a lot of money, but if you think you're putting five hundred birds in a show hall, that means you need to take five hundred pounds. Yeah. By the time you've hired your show hall at five hundred pounds, you haven't got a lot left giveaways trophies. No, exactly. And people don't understand that, you see, and unless we go back to like I said, running like I used to have to do and, and organise jumble sales to earn money to pay for them trophies. But unfortunately today, people want to just sit on the internet talking. They don't yeah. want to run the clubs anymore. And that's the sad part of the hobby, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, the internet's yeah. a fantastic tool, but it's, um, you know, it has we, its we can't have bird keeping or bird shows without... Uh, without having shows and somebody has yeah. to run them and unfortunately less and less people they're all sitting on the internet wanting to be critics and nobody wants to get out there and get off the backsides and do anything about it no um, i'm going to say i think it's just a case of getting more people to help out and hopefully people yeah, will, will, will do so and, and what yeah yeah and some Absolutely. people help by sweeping up some people help by uh, judging an event some people help by pulling the staging down some people are and and i don't care where somebody helps because they all make the show and it all makes the whole thing work yeah um, it's when nobody wants to do anything that you're left of the same six men that eventually say do you know what i've had enough of this um, yeah and uh, right. and they stop and that's where we come into in this country because we lost another club last weekend was it um a London club anyway that's just gone Walling oh, right. anyway we lost one last week and it's so oh, sad that I keep seeing that most definitely yeah well wow um, so just, just on uh, mo moving on from that a little bit then so what's what's been the most rewarding hybrid that you've bred you know, what's been your best one um, you see I don't like these questions because these questions to me are about showing and, right. and showing is showing is a small part of a hobby okay well what, what's yeah what's yeah, your favorite then what's what yeah. are you going to shed and say that what, I've, like that what I've bred is yes i've bred uh, i've bred crossbow mules and i've bred uh linny goldies and i've bred loads of goldie mules one year i've bred 50 greeny mules in one year and wow. um, yeah and i didn't keep any of them none of them have got the head that i was trying to achieve so they all went I've bred um, two, two red pole bullies, like I say, and lost them. I've bred linny bullies, goldie bullies. There's no end. I've bred, um, um, I've bred red pole goldies. I've bred 12 twite mules, of which one won best on flight at the All British at Winsford. And so, you know, we could go on about them. But to me, yeah. 
this world doesn't center around exhibiting or meet i run shows and i run clubs for all the people yeah. um i still only feel it's a very small part of the hobby and the hobby has got to be directed today around breeding um, yeah you know the days are gone where you know there's people that buy birds and i think that's great and if them birds are on the show bench they would be on the bench anyway and i just want to see them and that's what it's about what a show's about talking it's about there's only one person wins, and unfortunately, if you've got a canary bully, it'll be him every week. Yeah. And, and I will try and breed a canary bully if I can again, you know. Um, yeah. Time's coming, and I, and I would love to be the first one breed a half inch mule, you know, yeah. a half inch uh, crossbow. Wow, that would be uh, brilliant. It doesn't always happen. So to keep myself happy, I breed, I breed what I can every year. And, uh, and, and, you know, and yeah. show if I feel like it and if I don't, you know. Fair enough. Well, as long as you enjoy it, and that's that's what that's, that's what it's about, about, you know. Yeah. You know, so yeah, show that, to me, that's great. Show to me is where you meet like minded people to talk about yeah. birds. And, yeah. Uh, and, and winning is a, a complete bonus if you win. It's, it's absolutely oh, definitely. wonderful, but it's a bonus. Um, yeah. Um, you know, that's why when we go on to trophies and we say, you know, well, there you are, you've just won that show and he's five pound off you go. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, you wouldn't get me even clean my show cages out for five pounds. Isn't that I want the money? I don't want the five pound because I'll leave it where it is. It leave it in the club. Yeah. Um, I don't want to go to the National, for example. When I was a novice, I went to Alexandra Palace and... Uh, it was 500 and odd border canaries, and I won, I won best novice flighty border canary. You get borders as well in them days. And yeah. um, I didn't even get a rosette for that. It was a cash special. Oh, wow. So yeah. if you said to me, show me the rosette you won at the National at Alexandra Palace in 1970, whatever, six or seven, I couldn't show it you because it didn't exist. Yeah, it was a label stuck on the case to say I'd won best flighty board of canary, and it was, it was something like ten bob fifty fifty pounds. You know. Yeah, well, I, that's that that's it for me as well. Where I don't get me wrong, it's great winning the money because it just goes straight back into the birds and what. But yeah. but like yeah. you say, having something to say, I won this at this event for for this. It's you know I, I'm much further. I've got a few. Uh, trophies and won a few years ago from a, a CBS show, and and they're uh, you know a lot more special to me than oh I think I might have won five quid for yeah. for one of them at another show. You know I'd, I'd much rather win yeah. a trophy. So yeah, I'm the same, and all my trophies are still here. There's there's hundreds of them around from me days where showing was the most important thing in the world, and and yeah. I accept that's great for people. It's not so important to me now. But it's still important for me to for me to attend that show. If, yeah. I don't know if you can understand that, yeah, because you're still at that point where winning a rosette is is fantastic. Um, yeah. You know, um, to me, it's about just getting there and meeting people and seeing birds, and you know, because all week you can't talk birds with your with your friends; they're not interested. No, exactly. You know? Yeah, you you've got to be around other bird men to to so truly actually have a good conversation. Yeah. And when yeah. Staffordshire comes in on the 16th of January, we'll all be there in the show hall from early morning right through till the lifting. And we'll all be talking away and, and you've had the best day, you've had your fill, you've had what exactly. I call an fix. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I love doing that, you know, it's it's yeah. great, isn't it? That's right, so, yeah. So it's great. Yeah. So is there any birds that you've not yet kept that you want to keep? Is there anything you've not done yet? Yeah, there must be. Um, there's loads. You'll never do everything, and I've never done everything. Like we just said with meals and hybrids, there's lots of meals yeah. and hybrids I'd love to breed. Canary bullies and red pole bully I've, I've not achieved, even though I've done it twice. Um, I'd love to be the first breeder of, like you say, all finch. But finch-wise, yeah. um, no, not really now. Uh, I'd like to go back into all finches again. I would definitely yeah. like to start yeah. again and have another uh, eight to ten pairs of them. But uh, some of it would have to go now 
and the health not so good. So, I mean, I nearly got rid of the pied greenfinches last year, thinking, well, I've achieved what I wanted to do. Right. And this year I've now decided that, no, I'll, I'll stick with them another four or five years and see if I can, you know. Yeah. So, so again, you can't, when you've only got 28 acres, you can't do everything. No, exactly. Well, I mean, you, you've achieved an awful lot anyway, haven't you? Um, over yeah. the many years you've been doing yeah. it. So. I mean, just to show you, just to show you one thing. That, yeah. Um, just showing you now. Talk about keeping birds as a young man. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah, got you. Now, Cajun Avery birds used to do a section for the junior breeders. They don't do it anymore. And um, Hilton Blythe was a very famous man at the time. And uh, when I sent, you know, my dad filled me the application in and sent it off to Cajun Avery and paid for the, paid to join. And that's what come back. And that was um, in 1968, you see. Wow. And that, that was Cajun Avery Birds Junior Bird League. And that was the badge that they, all the children wore as they walked around the national to say, look, I'm a member of the Junior Bird League. Fantastic. And we give, and we used to do things around the venue for just for children to join in and drawing birds and special offers off different trade stands. And, yeah. You know, and when I grew up and run ceramic trophies, Every single year, I give a um, I give a, a clock with a kingfisher on, which was the emblem, and said yeah. Junior Bird League Member of the Year, and, and we presented it at the national every year to a junior. Um, Fantastic. To a, yes, to a to, yeah. to a junior person, um, you know, um, and, that, yeah. and, and that was you know that was that. Was showing That's up. brilliant. Yeah. Well, speaking of your memorabilia and all of that stuff, we've seen yeah. loads of photos and all that. What you know? What's what's the oldest piece that you've got? And um, you know what what, right, what really got you started? I'll just show you this one, then we're off this one. Yeah. Together. That's Peter Lander selling his book. I don't know if you ever seen Peter Lander's book. British yes. birds in agriculture. Me, me father's sitting next to to him. They're talking there about, uh, and he's selling his book. That's my son Christopher now. That's. You know that, that comes to show with me and my sister. Yes. Yeah. So that was the very first Staffordshire British Bird Meal Club show, thirty-five years ago. Wow. So uh, that was at that particular event. And, yeah. Uh, I wasn't living there at the time, but I actually live in the same street where that show is now, and I didn't, didn't <laughs> at the time. So it, that was strange. Yes. Um, Fantastic. You can go on to um, you were talking about the feeders, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. The oldest one, there's two. I'm just looking for a picture of it now. The oldest one is um, is um, is this one. Okay. Um, you see the one on the. I don't know if it's your left, the, the darker coloured yeah. one. Yeah. That that fell off the rigging of a ship in the 1600s and landed in plump in the water in the Thames. That was on right. a, that was on a cage hanging on a, a, a sailing ship coming into the Thames. And it was dug up by, um, I don't know what they call them now, what do they call them? Mudlarks. The right. Mudlarks they call them, they dig. And that's a, it's a feed, it's a lead feeder off a bird cage. And, um, so that's that one. And that's 1600. 1600. Yeah. <laughs> and this one was sent to me by a man named Roy Stringer. I don't know if you know Roy Stringer, I've ever heard of Roy Stringer. Yeah, Roy Stringer, been, yeah. Yeah. So Roy Stringer was um, Mr. Cage and Avery Birds for a good many years. And Roy sent me this. He was a metal detectorist and he was digging in Shrewsbury and he come across a musket ball inside this bird feeder. So that was 1700s, and the musket ball was with it. There was a couple of musket balls to this bird feeder. And these are normally found flattened because they're lead. But uh, I've got them in a book that actually proves that that's what they are, bird feeders. 
and uh, they had a wire that went around that uh, lip. Yeah. And that was, uh, you know, that was them. These are just a few of the others. Can you see those? Yes, yeah. So these are a few Victorian glass, um, Victorian glass feeders. As you see that, the little bit on the top there is where it hangs in the cage and the round circular hole goes up to a hole and we put the red through. Yeah. And uh, these are opalescent glass. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ones of those. Um, I could go on forever with those, you know. Yeah, that's um, brilliant. Wow. So I've got nearly two to three hundred of those. Um, ranging from there at 1600 um, through until through until um, until well, till the 1940s and if right. you look at these because they're on screen now Wow, look at those mainly Victorian bottle feeders uh, 1920s all these that you see in, in these trays there, they're still available now in plastic, but these were all in ceramic. Fantastic. And, uh, these glass drinkers down there are the same as you use today, similar. But yeah. They're real, real glass. Um, they're real glass, not, uh, not plastic, of course. Wow. So how did you get started out with all this? Yeah, what happened was I found, a fa I was in a man's bird shed, a friend of mine, when I was a young man. And he got two of them in the window, and they had capons right. on, which is a bird seed company. And they were they'd actually got the word capons written on, and uh, and uh, I said, oh, I love them. I've never seen them in glass. And I said, them would do for hang me golden mule out out in the cage, hang on the cage. And he said, take them with you, and he gave me two, and that's where it started. And since then, uh, everywhere I've gone, every antique fair or Everywhere I've ever gone, I've looked for them, and uh, you know, there's. Uh, you look at some of these. There's Chinese, and um, some of them were used for underground in a quarry when they took a bird underground, keep the water in. Can't point yeah. them out to you because I don't think my pointer works, does it? I know I can see it. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one it's on now is a deep. Cup that used to fit on in on a little cage on the wire with a hot through a hole. Right. And you fill that with water. And when they carried a, a canary underground for the gas, because if the canary passed out, they'd get out a bit quickly. Um, yes, but the yeah. water used to keep dipping out. So they made them very deep so that um so that um the, the yeah, water would stay in when it was being swung around, you see. Yeah. Um, and oh, you know, these just a few more. It just goes on and on, really. It's, There's some uh, amazing pieces you've got there. Yeah, there. Look, nest bowls. There. Look, you see the nest bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just fixed in the cage, and that's like you've got a bit of plastic today. Well, yeah. And that one there's a bird bath from the 1920s. Wow. Have baths, so I think was today. No, very different. These are Japanese. And um, these were done in pairs, obviously, Luke, pair of canaries, pair of owls. And underneath, some of them say made in Japan, but that one there says made in occupied Japan. And what happened was when the war finished, we allowed, we allowed the Japanese, after they'd lost the war, we allowed them to start making products again. But we made them yeah. put the word made in occupied Japan on the bottom of everything to prove they were occupied, you know. And that's one that was made. So we can date that exactly to be 1945 to 1950. Wow. You know, well, that, so, that's an amazing collection. Yeah. And, uh, and where I see them now is when you open a book, there's the lead one look, that we were talking about. But when yeah. you look in the books, um, these when you see a picture of an old cage, I, I regularly see these on. They are the original Capenas ones that the man gave me the two. And they say Capens on, which was a birdseed company. So they were even putting an advert on them as well. And, uh, and as I say, that's, 
And that, that one, where you see a piece sticking out the top, they were blown into a mould. So he, right. he, the man would heat the glass at the bottom, put it in a mould, close the mould, and then blow it. It would blow that, and then they'd just snap it off. Okay. Because they were cheap, that's how they were left. Yeah. And that's how they were left. And, Fantastic. Uh, I mean, what, yeah, what a brilliant that's, collection. That's them. Yeah, stop that. Fantastic. Well, you know, Bernard, that does take us to the end of our question. So massive thank you. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention to anyone watching? I'd, I'd, I'd like to show you a couple of price cards because we we did yeah. talk about price cards, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. When I went to Lancashire this week, um, one of the lads come up to me, which was Alistair Juna, and he, he said he's a few price cards for you. Would please put them in your collection, which people do from time to time. And yeah. um, and this was one of those. Um, I'm all linked up with you know. That's it. There. Sorry, I'm not so good at this program. Too. It's all right. Look at that. So as you see, these were Kate, these were prize cards given away. Um, that's a mule look. You see. Yeah. Yeah. Mule. And that was given, these were given away. If you look at there, that's 1921 from Aberdeen, Inverness, 1907, Best Bird in Show, um, 1906, um, 18, 18, 19, 1907, 1925. So they, uh, they do go back to the 1800s, I think, 1906. Six, yeah. Wow. So uh, that's a that's a cinnamon. Um, this that's was a, brilliant. Was cinnamon Norwich, but they look a bit different than the Norwich today. <laughs> yeah, very different. Yeah, just the last ones, um, and he gave me those. You know. Yeah. Which, uh, no, wow. thank you. Just quickly. That's super. Okay, so these are. These are price cards, and I don't know what's coming up because there's quite a few in this particular folder. So uh, you just get whatever you get. Um, there we go. So you see, that's 1900. And these were price cards that were put on every case. Now, when I first started, we had these, and these were given to you, and you got one for every bird that was placed. So we used to have an album and used to save them all in an album where we'd won them. What we'd won, it was like saving postcards actually, but and they were each different for each different club. And um, wow. these these were some of the little prizes. Now this was on the back of the cards. These were adverts on the back. So companies would sponsor the cards, and these adverts were paid. They paid for the cards, and they got out their product information. As you can see, that's. Uh, Hyde's famous mountain bread. Yeah. The look, and it's made, and Hyde's shell gravel. A penny a bag. You know, I so uh, now that was on the back, and then of course on the front is another one. Orange plume egg paste. You know, um, yeah. and it says down at the bottom, try Hyde's new lark food. Because they all kept singing larks in them days. Yeah, it's another story because I've bred quite a few skylarks here. So, oh, fantastic! Yeah. Well, well, I'm sure we'll have another another one to go. You know, another call at some point. You know, another yeah. episode yeah, of it. That'd be that great. Sprats, rum, sponsored by Sprats, the birdseed company, bird yeah. food company, and that that was for an Oxford show in 1895. Wow. Now. You know, Brilliant. that's a special card again, 1891. So these iron tonic grit, you know, these just go on and on and on. And um, but what, you, what you're seeing is the fact that um, it was something nice to win. Absolutely. And they encouraged a lot of people run them down and said they used to be all over the floor, nobody wanted them. And, the, and that's true, it was. Champions would pull them out of the cages and leave them all open the the floor to be swept up. Um, but to a, a novice just starting off, they were a lovely thing to, 
at least he went over as though he'd won something. Oh, most definitely. You know, and they did take a lot of filling in. Now, this one was um, the national exhibition that we talked about. And this yeah. was at the Royal Horticultural Hall in Westminster there in 1947. And that's the second prize. Wow. And that's a, a, a national place award. Now, yeah. even me, I've got stacks and stacks, which I haven't got them on computer, but I could show me. And uh, of, of the national, when we go first to seventh cards, so, so everybody that showed at the national, if you'd won three first, you got three cards to prove it. So you'd always got the Brilliant. cards to save, and I've still saved all mine because, uh, you know, and so will a yeah. lot of other people. So when people say they're not worth having, well, you know, that's that's all down to yeah. everybody's but, own. Interest, yeah. yeah. Well, it's more memories to look back on, isn't it? And and like you oh, say, was, something to oh, look at. So. Some, people, some people like going forward, not backwards. I, I find yeah. that we, you know, I find that we were much better years ago at everything than we do yeah. now. Today, now, um, I mean, for example, um, and I've just shown these many times, I know, but... You know, when you think that um, these medals yeah. all won at Crystal Palace then, at the sixth wow. and sixth there, these are more modern. These are all mine from me winning. Um, they're they're solid lovely, goals. Though, aren't they? They're all solid goals. Imagine wow. going to a show and coming back with a solid gold medal. <laughs> that, wow. Now these, <laughs> if, I, if I zoom in, can I, is it showing you? Yeah, when yeah. I zoom? yeah. When I zoom in there, if you look at those, that's a National British Bird and Mule Club medal. And on the back of these, it tells you all where they were won. All those are National British Bird and Mule medals. Super. They are solid silver. And, wow, um, a lot of money worth of these, isn't it? Wow. That's a solid gold, National British Bird and Mule Club, solid gold, nine carat gold. National British Bird and Mule Club, National British Bird and Mule Club. Um, now, they were giving them away for, di for, di for different shows. There's another bachelor, one of the National Cajun Avery Birds. Yeah. Um, you know, this just goes, you know, on and on. The first breeding medals we talked about. Um, yeah. They, they are in here somewhere, Nash, uh, you know. Um, spoons. Spoons. Solid silver, some of these. These are what I've won myself. The Society of British Bird Breeders, that doesn't exist anymore. National British Bird and Milk Club. We had a period in the 60s and 70s where we give spoons. Uh, five towns that was the club I run I actually drew that logo um, Cajun Avery Birds you see um, so there's lots of these Brilliant. medals and there you go Luke you see that's the national catalogue from 1935 and that shows you that you could swap your prize money for one of these medals if you look at that medal, yeah. we've just passed some of those. And they were yeah. made by Alexander Cross. So they weren't actually awarded by the club. In them days, you would have prize money. And I used to sit all night working the prize money. Out. You would have, if there were seven in a class, it was a full class, you got one fifth of the prize money, of the entry money. And, and if yeah. you come second, you got like a fourth and a third or whatever. So all them pennies were added up. And at the end, you were given that money. And you could take that money at the national and swap what you'd won for the first for that particular medal that says the National Show Crystal Palace Cage Bird Exhibition. You see if you look. Yeah. Yeah, and, got you. Uh, and they were given, and you could buy them in silver, silver gilt or bronze. And if you look back onto these, um, I'll just should be one in this. Well, there, they are then. If you look. Yeah. 
That's that's mm. their silver one. Wow. When you see wow. just about read that says Crystal Palace National Challenge Show, mm. Cage yeah. and Revered. And that would have been 1930, I think. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so that was um that was that's all of those. So. That's fantastic. I imagine this is only a very small part of your collection, isn't it? Oh, very minute. These yeah. are just bits that were on the computer that I could open up and show you while you were here. But um, it gets, it gets big. It's it's the, and and the, and the the paper stuff, the catalogues, the national catalogues from the nineteen hundreds and the articles. I mean, just. While we're on the subject, I've never shown this to anybody. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not that one. No, I haven't got it here now. Oh, there it is. I think. No, no, I can't find it. Uh, um, okay, no worries. There is breeding of a bird. Yeah, here it is. Let me open it now. And then we'll end on that if you've, if you've done. Yeah, yeah. That'd um, be great. So it's a snippet That's for cool. everybody to see. Um, at, at, at Luton Show, I had the pleasure of seeing finest Linnick green finches I've viewed for years. So there we go again, Linnick green finches. Yeah, you, know, you don't see them shown now very often. Um, last year at Luton, it was at the Crystal Palace Show of 1927. Can you read that? Yeah, got you. It was at the Crystal Palace Show of 1927. That the rare and unique Siskin Chaffins came out, showing the parentage well. We are therefore anticipating some interesting things this season in this section of our hobby. Now, wow. that was done by John Robson. Now, if you knew your history like I do, John Robson wrote the most wonderful book on hybrids. I've still got it. It's a leather bound edition, like a massive giant Bible. And uh, I've got it here. And uh, he wrote this in Cage Birds Annual 1927. So John Robson wasn't as a man talking on the internet that he'd seen a Siskin Chappie. John Robson was one of the top men of the day. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and he's written it in Cage Birds, but they did an annual every year, once a year. And he's read that there was a Siskin Chaffee at Crystal Palace in 1927. Now, wow, I mean, uh, I'd love to see one of those. Know that the Siskin Chaffee, she's never been recorded. No. So, well, that just well, shows you that, you know, I've got yeah. no more proof than that. I've got no well, more proof it, yeah. than that. If it's and, possible, uh, though, then people need to try I've it. I've got the 1936 National Catalogue. And right. it wasn't in there. So if anybody out there has got the 1931, we, we, we may see it exhibited, new exhibited. I don't know. Because these, no. these, some of these things are still knocking around. You know? Yeah. So, well, that's so, just a snippet to finish on. Uh, that, that, it's an interesting thing when somebody said who read the first Siski Chaffinch. You know? Yeah, well, that that's amazing. That well, Wow. <laughs> I can't get my head around that. Wow. No, and, and you see, I, I've wrote over 100, well over 100 articles for Cajun Every Birds, and it's only through research that I've wrote them because of my yeah. love of the hobby and finding out this sort of stuff. And so a lot of the articles that I've written have been done through research. And yeah. behind me here is all for my, you know, the cupboards are full of all the stuff that I can sit and go through forever and a day and find um, something that's happened somewhere, you know. Yeah. Or a picture of birds with a feeder on that I haven't got, that I'm still hunting for. Or, yeah. You know. <laughs> well, that, and so that, them things are interesting really. to me. Whether oh, most definitely. People, I don't know. But, uh, I, I, I certainly find it interesting. Hobby. Yeah, well, it's, it's all know, the history of the life. hobby, isn't it? You know? Have we covered everything, brilliant. you think? Have we answered everybody's questions? Yes, yeah, we have, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, Ben, that's massive thank you for your time and sharing, uh, you know, just a, a drop of, of your knowledge on that. And 
just ma oh. yeah just massive thank you i'll leave the link in the description of this video to your website um you yeah, know i've been on it a few times and what and then people can yeah. can look at that so yeah well massive yeah, thank yeah. you and on, and on my facebook page as well yeah i'll I'll, t I'll put that on there as well awesome brilliant Love yeah, it. massive thank you thank you so much All the, best. the only thing i do thank say you. to anybody oh. is please support your local clubs because we're struggling at the minute yeah and, um, and if you want this hobby to survive or like some of the stuff you've just seen i don't expect any clubs today to give off of these things out but wouldn't it be nice if we were um you know if, if we carried the hobby forward to the next generation absolutely um, better than better than we left it and at the moment we're going i'm going to leave it worse than than it was through my time yeah and we can't we can't do that we need to keep it going absolutely awesome well massive thank you that that's brilliant no thank you ever so much awesome so, so i hope you've enjoyed that obviously that's been an hour and 50 minutes with the zoom room with bernard and i must say a huge thank you again to bernard for taking time to do that and i'd like to say another thank you to avian world dublin for sponsoring natives in norwich so yeah just huge thank you everyone uh, for watching this video please consider subscribing down below if you enjoy this sort of content we've got a lot of new things coming this year we've got some exciting special birds coming in soon we've got a lot more things planned which you've not yet seen on the channel so please do follow along smash a like on this video as well and I'll see you in the next one.